morning everyone and welcome to worship in your home. Our call to worship comes from Romans 10.15, reading from the Good News Bible. And how can the message be proclaimed if the messengers are not sent out? As the scripture says, how wonderful is the coming of the messengers who bring good news. Father God, as we come before you this morning, clear our minds and hearts to receive your word and feel your love within us. Amen. And now we're going to sing a wonderful hymn by Fanny Crosby, To God Be the Glory. And today uh, I'm thinking about a game that Rob and me have loved to play over lockdown. And I'm sure some of you have played it before, Uno. And Uno is one of those games where um, it's trying to obviously be the one who has uh, got no cards left is the winner of the game. Now, if you've got a lot of patience and a lot of time on your hands, you can do something else with these cards. And I want you to have a look now at the picture, which shows you of a tar of uh, these Uno cards. And it's absolutely fantastic. Gotta add, me or Rob didn't do it, um, but someone else has taken the time to do that. And you can see that structure of that tar of cards has taken a lot of time. But what you will notice about that structure as well is that it's needed, particularly on the bottom, quite a few extra cards to make sure that it is 
in a good stable position so that it doesn't fall. And today's passage in Acts talks about Jesus being the cornerstone of our lives and actually how the Jewish people, when Jesus was crucified, they rejected that cornerstone. But actually for us as Christians today, that cornerstone is Jesus and our salvation is through him. And so that cornerstone should there, therefore be very important to each and every one of us. So I want you to think um, in anything that you do perhaps this week that involves building uh, maybe boxes and a whole range of different things that you're doing. Think about what structure is needed to keep that standing the way that it does. And hopefully uh, from that, think about how Jesus is hopefully the cornerstone in your life and how he's that major structure uh, that keeps you um, going throughout these uh, days that we, we have obviously lying ahead. Uh, and for a few of us, getting back into a, a, some sort of normality. Um, but I'm very much aware there are some people who are not in normality yet. And we, we pray and we think about those people uh, today as well. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the cornerstone in our lives. We thank you that you, no matter what we do wrong, uh, no matter what things happen, that you are the lynch pinch that basically holds us together. That when we fall, you are the one that picks us up. And so, Lord, we ask you today and in the week ahead, if you can be with each and every one of us and for us to know that you are that cornerstone. Um, if things get difficult, that you are there for us. And Lord, we pray for those people who are not, not out and about at the moment, but are still shielding within uh, their house. And we ask you, Lord, to be with each and every one of them and to keep them safe. And Lord, we also ask you to bless those people who are out and about now, to also protect them as they do their work or their visiting of other people and just be with each and every one of us. Lord, we ask this in your name, amen.
We give thanks for everything that we have been given and everything that God has entrusted to us. And we want to thank God for the gifts that people have offered his church and the time, the talents and the skills that they've put to use in his service. And also for the gifts of money that people have given in supporting the work of the church, the witness of the church and the mission of the church through Lillington Free Church and Radford Road Church. So the details are going to come up on the screen in a moment for anybody who would like to uh, give and support the church in, in any way to get in touch with either Margaret Bull or Linda Nason uh, and offer um, what they have to offer. And now we're going to give thanks for all that people give in his service. Loving God, we thank you for the beauty of the natural world, for the gardens that we enjoy, for the birds that we can hear, for these pleasant summer days. And Lord, as we Give thanks for everything that you have given to us. We thank you also for what we can offer back to you. And we ask that you would take these, our gifts and offerings, and use them in the pursuit of your kingdom, of justice and peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, we pray. Amen. Acts 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Cephas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and leaders and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, 
we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Amen. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Have you ever been upstaged? I can still remember Caterham School's house music competition. We were all so excited about it. We had gone very big. My house, Townsend House, had gone all crazy. Hawaiian t-shirts, a giant dancing King Louie, a blue bear and me in swaddling bands, in swaddling clothes, seated on a black grand piano. And the music starts. Now I'm the king of the swingers, yeah, the jungle VIP. It was fantastic. We had practiced it for months and I'd jump off the piano and I'd start dancing with King Louis and Baloo. And it was, it was more than a song. It was humor, dance, color, life to the performance. And we were confident that we were gonna win this thing. Just before we took to the stage, the other boys house, Viney house, brought their performance and to this day I can remember my heart sinking as they walked through the doors. They walked through the doors marching, 30 of them in matching black suits with bow ties, each carrying a red rose in their mouth. I, can rem I can't remember the song it may have been UB40's Red Red Wine or something like that, but I knew at that moment that they had made us look like amateurs. It is never nice being upstaged. But I had to hand it to them. Their performance was absolutely stunning. How we react to others' achievements is so very important for our growth, for our character. It's also the measure of how much we can learn from others. Our reading today follows Peter's sermon that we looked at last week. We saw how Peter and John had gathered a crowd in Solomon's porch and courageously declared the gospel to them. And a crowd, the crowd had flocked to hear Peter as he boldly declared the good news of Jesus Christ. So here the disciples are at the temple, just after the hour of prayer, surrounded by this crowd of people listening to them preach the gospel in the outer court. And the priests and the temple officials come out to see what all the fuss is about. Perhaps a third of the people who would normally come to pray had arrived and gathered. And so they come out of the inner court of the temple to see what's happened, what's going on, only to be confronted with this crowd of people gathered around Peter and John. Immediately, they felt upstaged. We're told in verse 13 that there is this sense of astonishment that these were unlearned men. And yet here they were teaching with authority. It is never nice being upstaged. It's even harder to accept when you feel that you have the right to top billing, as it were. So we're told that the reaction of the Sadducees and the priests and the captain of the temple guard is to throw Peter and John in the clink overnight. Now, there are many things that I would like to say about what has happened and what happens next. But because I'm a preacher, I'm going to try and condense it into just three lessons that we might be able to take away from Peter and John about their approach. And each of them begin with the letter C. The apostles show themselves to be courageous as they proclaim the gospel. The second thing I know is they, they show themselves to be courteous as they engage with their critics. And thirdly, 
they are clear or consistent in the message that they proclaim. So firstly, courageous. Last week, we saw that the disciples didn't pander to their audience. They didn't seek to make the proclamation of the gospel softer, nor do they cautiously pass up the moment and invite people to continue the conversation in a quieter moment. Far from it, the disciples were courageous in seizing the moment, seizing the day, courageous in the way that they declared the message and courageous now in the face of their arrest and imprisonment and questioning. Sometimes we need to be reminded that God calls us to be courageous too, to be willing to speak out of our faith to others. But if you find that a struggle, let me say that you're not alone. You are not alone. Even some of the leaders of the early church struggled with this too. Paul wrote to Timothy in his letter, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. And then he goes on to say, God has not given us a spirit of, of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. We need to remember that God has given us his spirit to equip us to be more courageous. You see, power is not only a gift that helps us to uh, withstand in a day of trial, but it's also a gift that helps us to advance the cause of Christ in our speaking and living the gospel of Jesus. This courage, though, or power, isn't a kind of brash or, or disrespectful gift, but rather it is controlled and courteous. And this is so very important. When we're having conversations with people who disagree with us, whether they disagree with our faith or an action that we took, when they voice a difference of opinion to us, the power of the spirit doesn't allow us to just bulldoze their objections. It's a power, though, that enables us to be secure in the word, in the good news that we have to share. It's a power and a courage that enables us to stand back and assess what is being said without feeling threatened by it. In our society today, we desperately need to model this kind of courteous and controlled engagement especially in our shrill political world. Consider the issue of Black Lives Matter, for example. We see some shouting back, all lives matter. And then others assuming that the only reason that they are shouting all lives matter is because they don't care or recognise the evils of racism or the impact that that has had on black people's lives. And almost always, these assumptions are wrong. Black lives matter isn't saying that only black lives matter. It's a way of saying all lives matter, but black lives are, are, the, are the lives that are threatened here. And those saying all lives matter aren't really closet racists. They're often very loving people who've misunderstood the context of that phrase, Black Lives Matter. And if we enter into, if we step back from the rhetoric for a moment and enter into a careful conversation, we can lead both groups to see that they are on the same side and to understand the importance of supporting positive change. Likewise, as Christians, 
when we have disagreements with others, if we can remain controlled and courteous as we explain our perspective, accepting that others are going to see things differently to us, then that will go a very long way to commending our faith. Peter and John are arrested. They're thrown into prison overnight without trial. And yet when they address their opponents in the morning, their words are respectful words. Just note what we're told here. Filled with the spirit, Peter said to them, rulers and elders of the people. Filled with the spirit, Peter said to them. Rulers and elders of the people. The entire tenor of his speech is respectful and courteous. They don't begin by calling out the rulers of the people as the murderers of Jesus. Nor is the court denounced as a mockery of justice. Though from the apostles perspective, the court may well have been that very thing. Instead, Peter speaks carefully and factually. And in answer to his accuser's question about the power or the name by which they've done this. Now, I've been reading a little about parenting recently, uh, and some of it makes sense to me and other bits seem uh, very exaggerated. But, but I'm coming across advice like, when you lose your temper, you're the loser. Or when you have to raise your voice, you've let down the argument. And maybe uh, that's a little over the top, but it certainly chimes with the example that we see here. The apostles are controlled and courteous, but they are also firm and clear. Clarity or consistency is so important. Think of recent and successful campaigns, whether they be the Brexit campaign or the lockdown. We see how simple and clear the slogans were. Take back control. For good or ill, almost certainly won the Brexit argument. Likewise, the slogan, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives, was almost more successful than they anticipated it to be because the instructions were simple and clear and people understood their urgency, their importance. The more people that you want to talk to, the more people you want to reach, the simpler your message has to be. Adver advertisers know this. In fact, it's one of the golden rules. Kiss or keep it simple, stupid. As Christians, we need clear instructions like this, whether it be John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or what would Jesus do? WWJD. These are 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 simple ways of communicating to people the good news of the gospel. They're simple ways of, of helping people to understand the challenge of the message of the gospel. Both Peter's first and second sermon here, and now his address to the leaders of Jerusalem, follow this principle, this clear, consistent message throughout. It is all about Jesus, notice. It's all about Jesus, crucified, risen and exalted. 
and now it crystallizes in another one of those bumper sticker texts. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name by which we might be saved. Acts 4.12. Now I must learn from this myself. I, I really must. By, by nature, I am given to overcomplicating things, to making statements that are complicated, even cautious. And, and there is a place for that. We need that, particularly when we're talking one on one or when we're addressing a meeting, sometimes we have to phrase things very carefully and put in lots of clauses to make sure that we are absolutely clear about what we're saying. But sometimes there is a need to be unapologetically simple and clear and direct as the apostles were. You, they said, you, they directed their message to the people. They cut them to the heart. The spirit cut them to the heart. And then the message was simple. Jesus is the cornerstone, the name above every other name. Salvation is found in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. And just as Peter proclaimed that message, we proclaim it today. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He is the name above every other name. He is the name by which we might be saved. It is Jesus. It is one word. It is simple. It is Jesus. Crucified, risen, exalted. Jesus, our Lord, our Saviour. Jesus. So let's sing that now. Let's sing Jesus' name above all names. Oh, 
God, our firm foundation, our soul's anchor and our heart's rest, we lift before you today all those who are grieving someone loved and cherished. You know their pain, Lord, and we ask you to draw particularly near to them at this time. Bind up the broken-hearted, comfort the sorrowful, and surround them with your love. We come to you this day in the midst of a fast and changing world, some of us excited about what the new normal will bring, some of us anxious about what it means for us. We pray for those who remain fearful of the future. We pray for those who are desperate to return to work and life. Help us to understand one another, to be emotionally aware, and to show great consideration of how others are feeling. We offer you the needs of our world at this time. We are shocked at the news from Reading and Glasgow. We pray for those whose families have been shattered by these violent events. Console those whose loss is greatest and who will feel deeply the absence of one they loved. Let justice be done that we might all live quiet lives in peace and security. We pray for the work of your church at this time, for churches planning to return to live services, for others considering their future ministry strategy. Grant wisdom to pastors and elders as they negotiate these decisions, that they will be the right decisions for their congregation and for the mission of the church as a whole. Help us to ensure everyone is included and no one is left behind. So let us continue by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Worshippers will share one song 
Let us go now in the mighty name of Jesus to love and serve him in the world. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you now and forevermore. Amen. God bless. Have a good week. Let it be.